We continue in our series this morning, uh, looking at the new things that God is doing. Our text uh, that we're going to be, primary text, we're going to be looking at a lot of um, text this morning. Um, so you might want to get your, uh, your Bibles out. The, many of the passages will be on the screen, but just if you want to let your fingers do the walking um, through the Bible, uh, that might be good. Um, but we're going to be looking primarily at Isaiah chapter 62, um, verses 1 through 5. We'll get there, there in a few moments. Isaiah 62, 1 through 5, uh, page 1,159 uh, in your pew Bibles. But as we come to God's Word, I invite you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, we stand before you. We've gathered intentionally in your name. We, we made a decision to get up this morning and to get dressed and to come here to this place. Um, it's a little cold for golf this morning, but we could have made other decisions, and yet we chose to be here. So we pray, Father, that you would honor that decision, and we pray, Lord God, that we would take that decision seriously, that we have set ourselves in front of you, in your presence, Lord, seeking you. It's a decision that we've made. And so, Lord, we Invite your presence here to speak to us, to work in us. We just ask for your strength to handle your word rightly, to understand it, to receive it, to live according to it. Uh, Lord, I just pray for your help today. I've rarely felt this much opposition to a message at times, and I just pray, Father, for your, your protection um, over me and over my brothers and sisters here. I think you have something that you want us to get today. And so, Lord, I pray that nothing would thwart that, that no distraction of the enemy or disruption of the enemy would do that. But you would lay claim to our minds and our hearts this day. You would enable a, a fragile and fallible man to speak your word. And you would uh, enable us to hear your word. Do your work in us, Lord God, we pray. In the strong name of Jesus Christ, we ask it. Amen. So God is making all things new, including you. We have learned, I won't, I won't quiz you today, but uh, I'll remind you today, we've looked at new covenant, we've looked at new birth, new commandment, uh, the new self, the new us. Last time we looked at new wineskins. Today, we look at the new name that God is giving to us, a new name. Names are significant. Often, the first thing that you do when you meet someone is that you ask them your name. You go to a new thing. You go to a, a conference or something. What do they give you? Name tags that you have to put on so that you can be identified. People can communicate with you. Sometimes, we use names to bless or to to speak hope. We do that when we name our children. So when Carrie and I named our children, we named our oldest Abigail. My father is joy. Not me. I'm often grumpy. So it's her heavenly father is joy. Um, our son is named after a, a great Celtic missionary and saint. Uh, his name means fiery one. Lydia was named after the first European convert of Paul. Uh, and a leader of a church there in Philippi, uh, this, this important name. So, so names are not just something to call someone. They speak hope. They speak purpose to that person. Names are important. They can cause blessing. They can cause conflict. In the international soccer world, I know I'm getting weird, but I like it. Um, international soccer world right now, there is a conflict going on about a name. A famous Italian soccer team called Inter Milan is upset that there's an upstart soccer team in the United States claiming to be Inter Miami. And there's an actual a lawsuit about this name, Inter. Because Milan says, well, that's our name. We're identified by that. When people say Inter, they think of us. So you can't have that name. And so there's a lawsuit because names are important. They're significant. They identify us. When I, uh, uh, my previous church that I pastored, when I first went there, its name was Sixth Reformed. Um, we tried to change that name three times. 
first time was when they moved from Patterson to North Halden. There aren't any other Reformed churches in North Halden. But they maintained Sixth Reformed because they only got about 30%. They put three names up and only got 30%. When I came there, I tried to, uh, with, with help from another person, we tried to say, hey, how about changing the name? Wow. I've always knew there were old fogies. I never knew there were young fogies. I met those um, when you tried to change a name. Like, everybody's like, whoa. But a couple years later, we said, let's, let's try it again. And we finally changed the name. But changing names can be hard because there, it's, we, we, we have this connection with them. Uh, they're important to us. And so people will, you know, oh, you're at Six Reformed. Oh, I, I mean, living word. Well, it'll always be Six Reformed to me. I, I hear that all the time. Part of that's because, well, it's difficult to remember Part of it's just because we're stubborn with names. And so and we do this to Rock Point. Oh, it's Covenant. <laughs> we, you know, we say, oh, at Rock Point. Oh, it's Covenant. Because na- names are, 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 are significant, and we're stubborn about them. Um, and so we, we, we think about the, the significance of names in the Bible, that the Lord's name is significant. It's a strong tower that we run to. Uh, when Adam named the animals, that was significant. Adam Calling his wife Eve is a, is, a, is a moment of intimacy and connection. And then God changing people's names in the Bible. Abram to Abraham. Sarai to Sarah. Uh, Jacob to Israel. These names of, of significance. Solomon was given the name Jedidiah, which means uh, someone who plays in a bluegrass band. <laughs> Actually, it's a beautiful name. Uh, Too bad it sounds that way, because it actually means beloved of the Lord. So it's solemn, but but the Lord said, I'm going to call you beloved of me. Um, uh, James and John were nicknamed by Jesus, sons of thunder, which kind of sounds like professional wrestlers. Um, Peter had his name changed uh, from Simon to Peter, meaning the rock. And so we see this, the, the significance of name changes in the Bible. And God promises you and I a new name. He promises his people a new name. We find this in Revelation. When he's writing, we have this letter written to the church at Pergamum. And it says, To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name on it, known only to the one who receives it. So this new name. Stones sometimes were given um, when, when there was a, a festival or party it was like your ticket to get in. And so it was a name, it was access, it was a new identity. To the church at Sardis, we read this, the one who is victorious will like them be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my father and his angels. And then again at the church to, at Philadelphia, I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God and the new Jerusalem which is coming down from heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. And then finally at the end of Revelation, uh, chapter 22, we read this. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Part of us are, were thinking, wow, that's really great. And part of us are thinking, that's really weird. Like, what are you talking about? Your name will be on, on, on my forehead. I don't really want to walk around heaven with this big, like, name on my forehead. What does that even mean? Well, you'll only understand it if you look back to Exodus. And you read about the description of the high priest who had a gold plate placed on the front of the turban so that across his forehead were the words, Holy to the Lord. And so as he went into the presence of God, on his forehead was the name of God and what God was going to do, holy to the Lord. And so it's an image given to us that we will then have access to the presence of the Lord. We, as a priestly people, will be able to enter into the presence of the Lord. His name is on us, holy to the Lord. It's amazing. And this new name was promised beautifully in our passage that we're going to focus on this morning, which is Isaiah 62, verses 1 through 5. And so you can look at the the screen with me, or you can read uh, in your Bibles, hear God's word. 
For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain quiet till her vindication shines out like the dawn, her salvation like a blazing torch. The nations will see your vindication and all the kings your glory. You will be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will bestow. You will be a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. No longer will they call you deserted or name your land desolate, but you will be called Hephzibah, meaning my delight is in her, and your land Beulah, which means married. For the Lord will take delight in you, and your land will be married. As a young man marries a woman, so your builder will marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. An amazing passage of Scripture. The context of this passage is the work of the Lord's anointed, the work of the Messiah, the work of Jesus. Because Isaiah 61, the chapter right before this, is the great mission statement of the Messiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me, to, you know, sent me out to, to uh, preach the good news. Jesus uh, laid claim to that reality in Nazareth when he read that passage. And so Isaiah 61 is this mission of the Messiah. Isaiah 62, which we're reading right now, is, is this, uh, this saving power that is seen through Jesus' work. It shows us that Jesus came to save. Salvation, then, is expressed with this new name that is given. Not only does the passage say, well, he's going to save you, but it expresses it through this new name, a change of name for those who have struggled. The passage states that God's people, because of this new name, will be vindicated. They will be saved. They will be restored. It says no longer will you be called uh, deserted. No longer will you be named desolate. You will be called Hephzibah. My delight is in her. And your land will be called Beulah, married. There's marriage imagery going on in this passage. Not deserted, not desolate, but married and delighted in. A covenant relationship in which God delights in His people. That's the picture of salvation that we see in this passage. For new names reflect a new reality. New names reflect a new relationship between, between God and His people. The new name that God uh, that, uh, that the new name marks God's uh, delight in us and His rejoicing over us. And that vision in Isaiah 62 is for us. Yes, it was to Israel. It spoke to Israel back then, but it's about Zion. It's about God's people now. We have been grafted into Israel through Christ. So this passage speaks to you and me right now, today. God promises a new name, a new name to his people. And that new name means new ownership, new belonging. Some of you know where I'm going with this picture. It's a picture of, of, of Woody from Toy Story. You may, I mean, every, pretty much every Pixar movie is amazing and, and profound in many ways. But um, in, in, in Toy Story 1 and Toy Story 2, especially those, um, the name was so significant. Uh, 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 Woody has Andy, his, his, the boy, who he, he's the toy that he belongs to Andy, and he has Andy's name on his foot. But when Buzz Lightyear comes, Woody gets jealous. Why? Because Andy wrote his name on, on Buzz's foot as well. It's this, I, it's this, this image of belonging, of ownership. And throughout the, these movies, the question is always raised, you know, does Andy still love me? Am I still uh, worthwhile as a toy? Or am I going to be cast aside? Am I still worth anything? And the name is always significant. In, in multiple scenes, they look down and they look at Andy's name written on them. And, and the, the message is, no, I belong. I am of value. I am of worth because I belong. It's a beautiful illustration of God placing his name on us. And therefore, 
we belong. We belong to him. He is our God. We are his people. He is our father. We are his children. He is our king. We are his servants. He is our savior. We are his friends. He is our bridegroom. We are his beloved, his bride. We belong. We belong. And what Toy Story, the, one of the messages of Toy Story is belonging means security. It means that you're safe. It means that you're valuable. So the next piece is this new name means new security. Now, some of you have security systems and maybe you have ADT, but, but this name means something more than, you know, secured by Mike. You know, like, that's not going to like if a thief comes up and, and they see that sign on, on, on the house, you know, Secured by Mike. They're, gonna be, they're not going to really like, be upset. But if there's a, a company name and they know that like, there's actual people who might respond to an emergency, they're going to maybe think twice. And so secured by, and they put their name there because the name proves the security. The name proves that there is someone who will respond in case of emergency. And so in, in God, when, we are put, uh, when his name is put on us, It is a sign of new security. There is strength. There is protection. There is God's ability and willingness to provide for us. We read in Scripture, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it, and they're safe. The name of the Lord is security. So when the enemy tries to attack you, you bear the name of the Lord. You are secure in the Lord. When the enemy wants to to say, did God really say? Are you of really value? Can you really be sure that you're going to go to heaven? Can you really be sure that God loves you? You have the security of God's name written on you. There is safety in the name of the Lord. He protects. He defends. There's also new reflection. This new name of the Lord uh, provides a new reflection. And so Vincent Van Gogh, one of my favorite artists, on all of his paintings, he would write his name, Vincent. But he didn't write his name on his paintings to show that they belong to him. Like, I painted this picture. I love it so much, I'm going to put my name on it because it's mine, and I don't want anybody to see it. No, he wrote his name. He signed his name on the portrait, or on the, on the picture, on the painting, because it was a reflection of his work. It was to sign his name to say, this is what I have made. This is my work. It is a reflection of me. And when you go into you know, the Museum of, of, of uh, the Met in New York, you, know, you see a Van Gogh, you, you just know a Van Gogh. Because there's something of him reflected in the, those paintings. 1 John 3, 2 says, when he appears, we shall be like him. When the Lord Jesus appears, we shall be like him. We'll, be, uh, we'll see him as he is. Ephesians 4, 24 says that we're put on the new self, uh, which is being created in the likeness of God and righteousness and holiness. There is a likeness to God that we have. Amazingly, in Ephesians 2, the Lord says that we are God's workmanship. We are God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus for good works that he's given us to do. And so we reflect the Lord. He places his name upon us, not simply for ownership or security, but to say, this is my creation. This is my workmanship. This is my grace in action in this person's life. And when people look at us, do they see that reflection? When people, when we walk into a museum, you say, oh man, there's a Monet, or you know, there's a Van Gogh. When they look at you, they say, oh man, there's a follower of Jesus Christ. I hope more and more that that becomes a reality. Because we are called to be a new reflection. Also, a new representation we don't use these very often anymore. I don't know how many people have a, a signet ring. I'm made fun of for having a stamp that has my name, you know, like the library of Michael Johnson, and I stamp it. A couple people who will remain nameless but who operate sound equipment um, have, have, have kind of mocked that. But at least I don't have a signet ring yet, you know, with a wax seal. That might be a little over the top. But 
in the past, that's how you would, you would say, you give your representation. You would seal something. Or if you read the story about Joseph, when Pharaoh uh, takes off his signet ring, gives it to Joseph, and basically says, the decisions you made, they're my decisions, because you represent me to Egypt. And so this ring uh, uh, was a symbol of, of representation. We bear the name of Jesus, and therefore we represent him. He says in Scripture, we are his ambassadors. We are his ambassadors with a ministry of reconciliation. We're sent out in the name of Christ to bear his name, to carry his message. We are his representatives. We bear his name. There's also new authority, new authority that is given. A name carries authority, especially a signature. So one of the most famous signatures of all, you know, John Hancock. That signature uh, carries authority. It, 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 it authorizes someone to do something or, or for something to happen. You sign your name on a check in order to authorize a transfer of money. You sign your name on, on important legal documents so as to authorize uh, something to be done. We have been named by God, given His name, the name of Christ. And therefore, we carry authority. We carry the Lord's authority. Jesus gave His, his disciples, His followers, authority and sent them out to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. Paul spoke about having authority to build up believers. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples. The church has been given authority. Uh, uh, Jesus talks about the keys of the kingdom being given to Peter. That what's bound on earth will be bound in heaven. We don't go out in our own name. We don't serve and go out in, in our own name. Or even in you know, the name of Cedar Hill Church. We go out in the name of Jesus. We stand in Him and in His authority. We speak according to His authority. He has given us authority to stand against the enemy. He has given us authority to preach and to teach, to be His ambassadors. He has given us authority to be His people. So we're to stand in that authority that we have in Jesus Christ. And finally, this new name gives us a new nature with new potentialities. Alec Motyer is a commentator who came up with that phrase. I love it. New nature with new potentialities. Christ has put his name on you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. These uh, Revelation passages that we read uh, reveal this, that God puts his name on us. He marks us. He marks our new nature. We read of this two weeks ago. When we looked at Colossians 3, remember it said, For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. There is a new nature in us. We're not the same when we come to Christ. There's a new nature in us. Our lives are hidden with Christ in God. Christ is our life because we have been raised with him to a whole new nature. And because of that new nature, there's a whole world of new potentialities opened up to us. Christians should not be hopeless. Christians should not be bored. Because of our new nature, there's, there's all these new potentialities opened up to us. I think of, 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 uh, of NASA, one of their new spacecraft, which they name all of them. This one is named Orion. And because it's supposed to go beyond just Earth's orbit, back into deep space, to go back to the moon, further, you know, plans to go all over the place. But I, I, I love it because it's a symbol of this potentiality. And they name it as such. We have potential to go further, to go back into space, to go into new frontiers. Maybe it's just the sci-fi lover in me. But I, I love this picture of potentiality that, that God wants to launch you. Not to, because all we've, what we've been doing in NASA for a long time is just orbiting the earth a lot. And now this is meant to go into deep space. 
And I think what God wants for us is stop just circling around and wandering around. I want to launch you into something deeper, into something more, into something further out. There's new potentialities because of what he has done and who we are in him. Not just circling around. And so he wants to give us a new name because he has more for us. I want to share a, an experience that I had in this. So I've talked a lot about Battle for the Heart and the Wellspring Group. I will talk a lot about, a lot more about them in the next coming weeks. Um, as uh, ho hopefully, not hopefully, we are hosting a battle um, in this area um, in the fall. But one of my experiences years ago, I think it was 2016, um, at the first battle for the heart that I went to, there's these times of reflection. There's times of teaching and times of reflection. And one of the times of reflection was just to, to sit uh, before the Lord uh, and Scripture and, and ask the Lord you know, to kind of speak into your life. What does God have for you? What does he think of you? We don't usually do that. What, what, God, what, what do you think of me? Uh, what, what do you have for me? And, and they suggest, you know, uh, maybe there's a, a word that you might hear or a picture that you might hear or even a new name, even a new name that God might give you. And this is not about, like, you know, adding on to Scripture or subtracting from Scripture. It's just, this is God speaking to your heart. It's what we read about in the Belgic Confession of the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. Just God applying his word into our life, speaking his love to us. And so I resonated with that piece of like, oh, a new name. That would be cool. That would be really cool. I had some friends that had had that experience. And so as I'm doing this, this piece, I'm listening to the song about being brave. And I'm thinking, maybe God will give me the name like Brave, Brave One, or, or Brave Heart, you know, something like that. That would be cool. And so I, I'm like, I, I don't want to just make this up. So I was with a, a team of other guys. I'm like, you know, if, if they somehow like say, hey, you know what, you just strike me as super brave, then I'll know that that's God's new name for me. And so we're having these small groups, and they're talking they're like, Michael, yeah, when I, I'm thinking about you this weekend, and you're just really courageous. I'm like, oh, so close, so close. And then another person would be like, yeah, and it, it, it's, yeah, I did, what did, what's the word? I'm like, with the brain, courageous. I'm like, oh, it's so close. And it never happened. I'm like, man, I just, I, I thought God was giving me this new name. It was going to be super cool and inspiring. And it just didn't happen. And then finally, we had this time where you, you're this kind of final sharing going on. And the facilitator of our group, you know, looked at me and was like, you know, I, I've just been thinking about your name uh, and your namesake, specifically your namesake, Michael, the warrior angel who who, you know, was a messenger of the Lord and who fought against the evil one. And I just think that's so significant for you. And it just hit me like a wave. I was like, wow, God just gave me a new name. Is, is my name. <laughs> but in a sense, he gave it back to me. He said, yeah, you, you don't need a new name. You, you're Michael. I have named you Michael. You are, my, you are my son. You are my servant. And I want you to be my messenger. I want you to stand against evil. I want you to be strong in the Lord. I want your name to ask the question, who is like God? And so I felt in that experience that God gave me my name back. He kind of restored and deepened my namesake. And it was a, a powerful moment of just God speaking his name, giving a new name. And maybe the Lord wants to, to do that in your life, maybe in some way. I don't know, it's not in the same way. Maybe to give you a new name. Or maybe just to give you a word of encouragement, what he thinks of you. I would encourage you to ask the Lord. Take time. and just ask, You can do that. It's just, Lord, what do you think of me? Lord, do you, do you really love me? Do you, what, what, do you, what do you have for me? What do you think of me? I think that's a good prayer to ask. Because it, it, it's really important because, because the world wants to name you. This fallen, broken, sinful world wants to name you. It wants you to bear its name. This world wants to give you its name. This world wants to define you and to control you and to mold you into its likeness. Not in the likeness of Jesus, but into its likeness. It wants you to bear its name. And so the world will often call you names because it's not very nice about this. And maybe you've heard some of these names. Loser, the name given. 
good for nothing, worthless, ugly, stupid, hopeless, unlovable. I'm sure you've heard many others. I don't want to get too deep into psychology today, but I know that many of us here probably are struggling with names that we heard used about us perhaps years and years ago. And we say things like, oh, sticks and stones may break your bones, but words and names will never harm me. What a lie. What a ridiculous statement. Of course they hurt you, us. And some of you have been wounded by the world with words even worse than these. Titles that are given. Ways that the world has tried to define you. And you hear these words and sometimes we start living out of these worlds rather than the new nature that God gives. We believe the lies that are told to us. We believe the shame. We believe the guilt. We believe the condemnation. But God wants to give you a new name. And when he names us, it's not loser or good for nothing or stupid or hopeless or unlovable. If you hear God calling you those things, that is not the Lord. When he calls our name, he says, you are my beloved. He says, you are my friend. He says, you are my child. You are my people. You are my disciples. You are my son, my daughter. You are the one I delight in. I didn't come up with these terms. This isn't my wishful thinking. He does this in the Bible. Sings over with his delight. My delight is in her. You are my son and my daughter. Not my people will be called my people. That's Hosea. He's called, we're called disciples, friends. Jesus says, you are friends of me now. We're his child. We are his beloved. Those are the names that God gives to us because of his work in us through Christ and the Holy Spirit. He gives us a new name. These names. His love for us. And ultimately, he will give us the name that is above every name. This is the amazing thing. Like, I'm, 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 I love it. I'm not loser. I'm beloved. That's awesome. But it goes even more. Because he will give us the name that is above every name. His name on us. He gives us his name. That Jesus, we bear his name. We bear the name of the Lord, and that changes everything. When God puts his name on you, it changes everything. It means you belong. It means that you are safe. It means that you reflect him. It means that you represent him, that he's called you, that there's purpose in your life to represent him. Oh, there's no way I could possibly do that. Yes, there is, because he's put his name on you. I don't have what it takes. I don't have the skills. Yes, you do, because he has made you. You are his masterpiece. And you may be different than the other person that you think is all great, and Jesus can use that person that can never use you, but that's not true, because he's called you, and he's put his name on you, and there is value because of that. We can have authority in his name, and we have been given a new nature and new potentiality. In him. We are in Christ. Christ is in us. We bear his name, and that changes everything. And so may our prayer be that of Madeline Langell that I read at the beginning of this service. O burning sun, fiercer than furnace flame, O purifying one, come. Burn me with your name, with thy name. So, dead to sin, alive only in thee, my life begin now and eternity. Oh, Lord God, that is our prayer. I hope that is our prayer. It can be our prayer for those who will receive it. Lord, that is our prayer that you, O burning sun, Lord Jesus, you the purifying one, that you would burn your name. Mark us indelibly with your name so that dead to sin, alive only to thee, that our lives will begin and then we'll continue through eternity. That is our prayer, Lord, and we can ask it because it is also your promise. 
Thank you, Lord. Amen.